Question 41. Suzanne Jennings purchased bond A with a coupon payment per period of 4% for four years at a price of $106. The bond is most likely trading at par value, a premium, or a discount. So we can uh, just look at the price here to know what we're trading at. And simply, if it's trading above par, it's going to be a premium. If it's trading below par, it's going to be a discount. And if it's trading at par, it's going to be par value. Par value is um, 100, as it is, as we can assume for a bond, as we can assume for bonds. It'll either be a 100 or a 1,000 based on kind of what they give you as price in the question. So since this is trading above the par value, it's going to be trading at a premium. So we can go ahead and go with B. Par value would mean it's trading at 100. Discount would mean it's trading uh, below 100. So we can cross those off. Question 42, all else being equal, which of these is most likely to have a lower yield? A two-year bond, a five-year bond, and a 10-year bond. I'm gonna pull in this pretty simple graph here. So this is generally what the yield curve is going to look like. So we have yield here on the y-axis and time on the time to maturity on the x-axis. And essentially, as we go further out on that x-axis, investors are generally going to require more yield if they're locking their capital up for longer. Um, so for that reason, the yield curve generally is going to be upward sloping. So two-year bond might be down here, 10-year bond is going to be up here. So all else being equal, we're uh, generally going to have a lower yield on the two-year bond. So A will be correct. Uh, we're sitting here at October 2024, and this is not what the yield curve has looked like. In fact, it's been completely flipped um, for most of the last couple years and the two-year bonds actually been trading up here and the 10-year bonds been trading down here um, so that confuses things a little bit but in general the yield curve is going to be upward sloping so we'll stick with a two-year bond question 43 should an investor buy a 10-year bond priced at 1085 with a 10 percent semi-annual coupon if the comparable bond yield is nine percent so we're, this bond is priced at 1085 um, and we need to figure out whether we want to buy it or not. Our answers are no, the bond is undervalued by $20, no, the bond is overvalued by $20, or C, yes, the bond is undervalued by $20. So looking at these, we can go ahead and cross off A right away. Um, if the bond is undervalued by $20, this this should be yes, we'll definitely want to buy it, which is what this answer C down here is. Um, so from here, what we need to do is we need to figure out what the we think the value of this bond is. So I've got the calculator up here. We're basically going to use these numbers, 10-year uh, bond, uh, semi-annual coupon, and the comparable bond yield to um, figure out the present value of this. So let's look at the calculator here. For N, we're going to have 20 since we have a 10-year bond at semi-annual coupons. So we'll do 10 times 2, get our 20. The semi-annual is also going to cut the coupon and the interest rate in half. So we're going to have 4.5 for our yield rather than 9. Our present value is what we're going to solve for, so we'll skip that. Payment is going to be 50 since we have semi-annual coupons it's going to be 10 percent of the par value which is a thousand um, so 10 percent of a thousand is a hundred divide that by two gives us payment of 50 and then lastly our future value is going to be that par value um, of a thousand so from here we're going to hit, uh, hit compute present value gives us 1065 and some change so we're valuing the bond at 1065, but it's actually priced at 1085. So if we're buying this, um, we're technically overpaying since we're getting a higher price than what it's worth. Um, so we're not going to want to buy this bond. So we can look, let's look at these answers. So we've got no, we don't want to buy it. The bond is overvalued by $20. It sounds like it'll be our answer. Or C, yes, the bond is undervalued by $20. Uh, that's going to be wrong. Um, we we have a value lower than the price, so we think that the bond is overvalued. Answer B. Question 44. Which of the following is most likely cor correct regarding true and street convention yield? The true yield is always equal to street convention yield, never less than the street convention yield, and never higher than the street convention yield. 
So the main difference between these two, so for true yield, um, we're going to be using the actual calendar days um, for determining the payment date. So the issue that comes into play here is if the payment date falls on a weekend or on a bank or on a holiday, um, the payment is going to get pushed to the next business day essentially. So we're going to get paid later than we really should have. Um, street convention yield is basically just excluding weekends and holidays, so it's only including days where you could actually get paid. So the yield is always going to be um, more trued up and accurate, whereas the true yield can get um, a little messed up if the payment falls and it comes later. So if the payment does come on a holiday and we pay later, that's going to lead the um, yield to be lower, potentially. It's going to be pretty minuscule, um, but looking at our answers here, it's not always going to be equal. If that payment falls on the holiday, it could end up being a little different, never less than the street convention yield. It's not going to be um, higher because we're getting the payment later, so that would be discounted um, at a higher, at more days, so it's going to be a lower number. So never higher than the street convention yield, this is going to be correct. It'll always either be equal um, if none of the payment days fall on weekend or holiday, or it could be just um, minimally less. So we'll go with C. Question 45. Which of the following is the highest ranked debt? So highest ranked basically means um, which debt is first in line in order to, to collect the assets in case of default. So we've got A, first lien loan, B, senior unsecured loan, or, or sorry, B, un senior unsecured loan, or C, senior subordinated. Um, first lien is going to equal first uh, claim on the assets, so it's going to be above senior unsecured, which is not going to be uh, collateralized by any specific assets. Um, and subordinated, it's kind of right there in the name. It's going to be uh, subordinate debt to other debts in line. So stick with A, first lien loan. Question 46. All else being equal, a, call a callable bond is more beneficial to the issuer, the investor, or neither the issuer, investor, or the issuer. So the call feature is going to allow the issuer to call the bonds back when they want at some preset redeemable price. Um, and so this is going to be a benefit to the issuer. And where this really comes into play as a benefit is if um, interest rates fall, the issuer can basically call the bonds back. If interest rates fall, or maybe let's say their debt gets upgraded so they could now issue debt at a lower rate, um, really any reason they could issue bonds at a lower rate. They can call that debt back from the investor and then reissue debt at a more favorable interest rate, um, which is going to be the main benefit for the issuer, not the investor. There's some benefit to the investor because um, that call option has value, and so there's, ge there's generally going to be a premium starting yield on that bond, but there's just going to be a lot more reinvestment risk because if rates fall, your bond's going to get called away, and then you're going to have to reinvest at lower rates. So the main beneficial, it's mainly beneficial to the issuer. Question 47. The current price of a bond is 1054 when the yield of maturity increases by 1%. The price of the bond goes down to 1023 When the yield to maturity decreases by 1%, the price of the bond reaches 1084 What is the modified duration of the bond? So we're going to be using our uh, approximate modified duration formula here, and we're given all the inputs. We're just going to be plugging these in. So in the numerator, we've got PV minus, um, which is going to be the present value of the bond when uh, rates fall. So when it decreases by 1%, the price of the bond gets up to 1084 so that's what we're plugging in there. And then PV plus is uh, what we're plugging in if the um, interest rate increases. So here we've got increased by 1%, price of the bond goes down to 1023 So that numerator is going to be the difference between these two numbers here. And then new, uh, in the denominator, we've got 2 times the yield. Um, times uh, the starting price. Sorry, two times the change in yield. So that's going to be what we're increasing or decreasing by. So that's going to be our 1%. And then our the starting uh, bond price will be that 1,054. 
So pulling that in, we can see those numbers plugged in here and we see that brings us to 2.89. Answer C, question 48. Investor X has an investment horizon of three years and has invested in a 4% coupon bond with a yield to maturity of 6%. Investor Y has an investment horizon of 10 years and has invested in a 5% coupon bond with a 5% coupon paying bond with a yield to maturity of 5%. Which investor most likely faces higher market price risk compared to reinvestment risk? So looking at investor X, sorry, let's look at the answers. So we've got investor X, investor Y, or C, they have the same market and reinvestment risk. So investor X is going to have less reinvestment risk since he's receiving 4% coupon bonds. Um, but the yield to maturity of those bonds is 6%. So what this is indicating is that new bonds being issued are likely going to be paying coupons in more in the 6% uh, range. So he's receiving coupons at 4, but then he's reinvesting them at 6, so there's less reinvestment risk there. Um, so therefore, he's going to have more uh, market price risk. So we're likely going to go with Investor X here, but let's just uh, walk through Y to make sure we can confirm that. So with Investor Y, they're going to have greater reinvestment risk, um, and this is going to be more so based on the time horizon. So we're invested at 5% with a yield to maturity of 5%. So this bond is priced based, should be priced at par or close to, um, close to it. But the problem is our investment horizon is 10 years. Um, so that's 10 years where this rate could go up or down. And if it goes down, then our coupons are going to have to be invested at those lower rates. Um, so investor Y is going to have more reinvestment risk. Investor X will have more market price risk. So we will go with A. Question 49. All else being equal, an investor will most likely prefer a bond that is less convex, more convex, or less or <coughs> convex depending on the portfolio. So I'm going to pull in this table here to kind of illustrate a simple example of convexity. So positive convexity is going to be when the price increase from rates dropping is better than the price decrease from rates increasing. So let's say our par or our par value is 100 or our current value is 100. Sorry, not par value. Current value is 100. In the scenario that rates decrease by 1%, let's just say, for this first bond, the price of the bond is expected to go up to 103. So that's a plus three um, increase for a 1% increase or decrease in the rate. Let's say for a 1% increase in the rate, the bond price is going to decrease down to 99. So for the same plus or minus 1%, this bond basically has an asymmetric uh, risk return profile. If the rate goes by down by 1%, we're going to make 3% in the price. But if it goes up by 1%, we only lose 1%. Negative convexity is going to be the opposite of that. So the current price is 100. When rates drop, we would only go up 1%. And then in this scenario, I made it so when rates increase, we're going to lose more. So convexity is really kind of... Um, describing that asymmetric profile. And so we're always going to want more convexity because we would prefer to have a bond that has this uh, asymmetric profile in the positive way for us. So all that said, we are going to go with answer B, more convex. Question 50. A bond investor has an investment horizon of six years. He recently calculated the Macaulay duration of his portfolio at nine. What is the duration gap? So duration gap is going to be a pretty simple formula here. It's just going to be that Macaulay duration, uh, which we've got at 9, and minus the investment horizon of 6. 9 minus 6 gives us 3, so we will go with answer C, 